broke my I've broken my first rule of life. I've gone Japanese. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 10 of the Collecting Addicts podcast with me, Neil Clifford, Chris Cooper, Manish Pandey, Edward Lovett. Straight in. How about this one? Bond cars, bond car chases, and we'll allow just a bit of general car chase on film chat. I'm going straight in to the man that makes films about people and cars, Manish Pandey. Surely his opinion matters more than all of ours put together. <laughs> I doubt that, but... I think the, um, the absolutely, it isn't just for me the best Bond chase, but really is the best car chase, is from The Spy Who Loved Me. Yeah. And it is the yeah, Belgiet yeah. Ranger versus the Lotus Esprit S1. And it is just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tackle this in terms of filmmaking, okay? This is, for me, the best filmmaking there is because there are no special effects in this. There is no CGI. You actually have a real car, a real helicopter, and real people driving and flying these things. And yes, Roger Moore and Barbara Bach are in this, this mock-up with a kind of, you know, matte screen behind them. But a real stunt driver that you're going to talk about drove this car. And I don't know who the helicopter pilot was, but what's brilliant about this is it begins with a really clever wide shot of Sardinia. And you see this tiny little white thing just going be like so you have no idea what's coming. And then as the car goes into this little town square, it's a very, mm. very low camera and it's a medium shot. And the car's coming towards you, and the camera just pans very slightly to the right, and it reveals a motorcycle front wheel. And then you see the motorcycle boot, then you see the whole motorcycle, and then you see the thing being kicked started, and you realize it's got a sidecar. And then we're with James Bond, and he's sitting there, and Roger Moore looks in his rear view mirror, but he, it, a lot of people think these films are very sexist, and this is the least sexist Bond movie, because actually Barbara Bart's a bit smarter than him, and is constantly outdoing him, and she says, can you see that? She says, he doesn't say it. She says, do you see that? And he completes her sentence. Yes, the motorcycle has been following us for a mile. And then this thing releases the side pod. And basically it's a missile. And he does this unbelievable slalom between two trucks. The trucks are coming at each other. And the guy, this is not CGI. A stunt driver drove this Lotus Esprit in between these two. And if he'd mistimed that, he'd have been squelched. And then you have this great joke because the missile hits the truck, which has got slumber mattresses in it. Mattresses, yeah. And it's great. You see this model flying off into the kind of Italian ocean. And, 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 and Bond has that great quip, doesn't he? He goes, all those feathers and you still can't fly. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, it's such a genius line. After that, yeah. we have the Ford Taurus oh. chasing him. Yes. And then you see Jaws. And it's a great piece of character, this, because Jaws sticks his head out. He runs out of bullets. So he grabs the gun from the other baddie just to shoot at James. From the back. Of course, yeah, from they, the they back. managed to drive this car off a cliff and it lands at an Italian farmhouse. And you remember the little drunken Italian peasant comes like, mamma mia, che succede, or like that. So he's still sort of laughing again. And you think, well, where's this going? And suddenly a black Belgian Ranger comes up and it's an amazing shot. It's riding parallel to, um, to the Lotus Esprit. And we look inside and it is Caroline Munro, quite possibly the most beautiful yeah. woman God ever created. And she looks across in this slightly cheeky way at James because she knows she's going to kill him and she winks at him. And it's 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 fast cars, it's sex, it's it's danger. I mean, it's just everything you want to see. And then what you have is probably the best stunt choreography I've ever seen. Fixed camera, a little one point perspective that Lotus goes whoosh. And then the helicopter suddenly comes down, literally road height, shooting the shit out of the road and then i mean it has even the most amazing shot where you lose the helicopter and you wonder where's this helicopter gone and it's waiting for him the car's coming right at you the helicopter the 180 and goes after him and all of this okay you, you, how could it possibly get any better he flies off a pier 
and the car turns into a submarine. He uses yeah. a tracking device and he says, time to get rid of unwanted guests. And he presses a button and <laughs> Caroline Monroe's dead. There's no more. It just does not get better mm. than this. It has never got better than this. That's it. Are you allowed to, is he allowed to be wrong or have we got to give up and go home? <laughs> you know what? I, think, I think maybe we could just all concur. And yeah. I, I, I think what, like any, any piece of film or television that, that is, that just sort of transcends time, we all take slightly different things from this clip, don't we? we all remember, I think we all have bits that are a bit more memorable. There's a scene that managed to describe there that for me resonates one particular reason. When the helicopter is just shooting, the, as you said, the shit out of the road, for me, it's the best sound I've ever heard a gun make. It's yes. a really distinctive ping, ping, ping noise when, it, when, the, when the bullets come out. It's the definitive noise of a gun. I, I just adore the driving. Um, and I'll fill you in on the, on the backstory of it. This has been written about many times. Um, Matt Becker, who's a friend of mine who used to work in uh, chassis ride and handling at Lotus, which is about the best job you can have in the world, then moved to Aston Martin. He's currently got a very senior position at Jackie Land Rover. His father, Roger Becker, worked for Lotus when Colin Chapman did the deal to have the car in the film. Oh. As ever being as ever being Lotus, they were behind time and Colin had got it a bit wrong. So they, they had to get this car to Sardinia at the last minute. He basically he drove through the night to get it there, got there, and they had to start doing stunts straight away, stunt driving straight away. But this thing was a was it 2.2 litre, normally activated yeah. Lotus, didn't have much power, awful lot of grip because it's mid-engine. And they couldn't make it, they just couldn't drive it dynamically. The stunt yeah. drivers never driven anything like it. They were used to having loads of power to rotate the car. And they said to Roger Becker, well, you seem to be able to drive it. Can you drive it? So he ended up doing all the stunt driving in The Spy Who Loved Me. So you can you imagine when Matt, who's about, who's about my age, was a little boy, he could turn around and say, my daddy did the driving in my the best on chase sequence of all time. I mean, to, are you, if, oh. if everyone thinks their dad's a, already a hero, mm. that surely would, would elevate them to another status. And we'll put some photos up now. This is Roger Becker, who sadly passed away not long ago with... Um, with Jaws, the actual page name escapes me. Um, and uh, and here's an action shot of the, of the helicopter and the car together. But I just, and, and I, a couple of years ago on Top Gear, were lucky enough to have access to to um, to some of the Bond cars, the, the real Bond cars. There's a hangar somewhere in the UK in a secret location where they have them all on racks. Every vehicle that's ever been in a Bond film is owned by the Broccoli's and it's there by Eon Productions and, and you can go and see them. And wow. the the buck of, the buck of the of the submarine is there. We had it in the studio. Of course, it's it's meaningless. And and you, the more you look at it and scrutinise it, the more you feel like you were a bit duped. And how did you ever believe it? But it does. Is this, it makes is that where JLB dubbed you as Doctor No Hair? No, that was another one. That was uh, that was in uh, that was another film in in Montenegro of all places. But but I just there's a magic about the spy who loved me car chase. Yeah, I don't know whether it's because the car becomes a submarine or what is it. Or is it actually that instinctively, the way Manish has just, just broken it down there in, in sort of professional terms, is it that instinctively we all know great filmmaking when we see it, we just it's, don't know we're seeing it? Is that I, the I case, Manish, or not? I think so. As I said, it's all in the setup. It's, it's like a great joke or a great story, you know? It just, it, they it, these are people who really know what they're doing. They've been doing this for a very, very long time. They've seen every car chase there is, and someone has created this. They said, look, let us have a helicopter chasing this car and let us turn this car into a submarine. And it all sounds preposterous, except they pull it off. And it's done so subtly. As I was saying, beginning with that wide and just that very far off noise of this Lotus, meh, like that. Yes, it, your engine. Mm -hmm. Great for so it I think it's, you off. The, it's, it's all of those things. And it's, I think the theme music, we've talked about this offline. I think the Carly Simon theme music to Spark is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Wet Nelly, the, the waterborne version was called, I guess by a production group, Wet Nelly. Do you know why it's called Wet Nelly? Because in Little Nell, You Only Live Twice, the Little auto Nell. gyro was called Little Nelly. Yep. And in that film, I forget the guy's name now, very extraordinary British inventor, industrial engineer. In that film, Little Nelly was driven by its inventor and engineer so it's a real beautiful symmetry yeah. between those two films and those things but yeah i think it's um everything else is kind of playing for second place um but in the bond films it's not a car but the live and let die boat chase in the louisiana swamps was just <laughs> yeah. yeah 17 boats were destroyed yeah no. in the making of that 
Um, the, the Bond car, the boat, Glastron GT15, it's if asked anybody our age watching that time, draw a speedboat, we'd have drawn a Glastron GT15. Yeah, that, yeah, that one, yeah. Little homing in the canopy, looks like a Learjet's windscreen, that beautiful 70s. Yeah. yeah. Just a wonderful thing. And we introduced us to Sheriff J.W. Pepper. Oh. That <laughs> That's exactly what I've got written it, down. <laughs> when the guy takes away at the end and says, Sheriff, we need to talk to you. And quite no. He goes, secret agent? <laughs> <laughs> On whose side? <laughs> yeah. no, he, uh, they are um, they're marvellous. I have to say, with Bond films, one of my secret pleasures is, is not the longer sequences. I love some of the shorter cameos by cars. Um, for example, I, I always love saying to people, in which film was there a Porsche 928? Um, which Bond film was there? And that there was a Porsche 928 parked outside the chateau where Zorin was having his horse yes. uh, sale in Need a kill. 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 Um, But it was just parked there. And I, I, would, I would watch the film and freeze it on the 928 to work out if it was an S or an S2. Um, <laughs> although S2 was never sold in Europe. Um, and one of, But my favourite cameo in terms of action driving, which I, I maintain is the single finest piece of accurate um action stunt driving for me is the alpha gtv and octopussy and it's why yeah. Octopussy remains a much better bond film than manage will ever admit to himself because anyone that could drive a gtv like that on a dry road coming into an, an american military base is is a genius frankly I, and it's so it, that sequence actually is incredibly exciting some high quality driving in bmw e28 5 yes. series um you know really really good stuff uh, but but it, it does all come back to Spy Who Loved Me. Edward, you had Live and Let Die, did you? Well, I, I, I did because I, um, Roger Moore was definitely my Bond. And uh, I, I think the memorable moments for me are the ones that I just laugh. And I, J.W. Pepper, well, I just think is brilliant in those two movies. And uh, in the AMC uh, Hornet, when he does the corkscrew, yes. Um, I, you know, th those are just the scenes I, I remember as a kid. But having a flick around YouTube this morning at some of the old scenes just makes me want to go home and do uh, do a twenty four hour stint of watching Bond movies. Well, I think there must be a rule that you, your chosen Bond is when you're between the age of ten and fourteen, because for me, Roger Moore is Bond even though now you sometimes watch them and you think, oh, maybe they're a bit cheesy or whatever. But he is Bond to me. Roger yeah. Moore is Bond. And I think yeah. I Love Me, which is, I think, probably the first film I went to without my mum or something. Yeah, it, was, it was, it was a, it yeah, was a moment too. of growing up. Yeah, exactly. Me too. And um, doing what you want with, with your mates or whatever. That will always stick. And, you know, that Lotus, it was the Lotus driving into the sea for me. That was the moment that I thought that is just the best thing I've ever seen in my life. That that car has turned into a boat. Who had, who had the corgi little toy? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. never worked. For, never worked properly. It didn't work. Yeah. properly. it was a real fuss at the time. It was a bit of a corgi got slightly in cold water. Was there a recall? There might have been a corgi <laughs> recall. Elon Musk yeah. had a bit more money. He bought the real thing. But you, if you <laughs> saw that film in the cinema, Neil, Chris, you know the. You know, you have these joint, these massive experiences in cinema. Sometimes when the crowd absolutely all thinks the same thing. It's after yeah. the ski chase at the beginning. When the Union Jack flag oh, comes yeah. up and he's going into that valley. I mean, the cinema erupted. Um, it's about four yeah. minutes into the movie. Yeah. You know, it's well, what was it, 77? Yes, exactly. Exactly. So yeah. it was Jubilee year as well. You know, it was Jubilee, just Jubilee insane. year. I was, it I was, was insane, you know, on a I was, I was 10. I can remember going to watch, I think the first one I watched in the cinema might have been Octopussy, or maybe it was the one before that. And I can remember my father, my late father, making me wear a blazer um, because it was a PG, just to make sure I looked old enough. I'm thinking, why do you need to wear a blazer to watch James Bond? <laughs> <laughs> is that, is that were, the one with uh, the were... DJM charge in it, the tennis player? Yes. 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 He was in Octopussy, wasn't he? Has he anyone was. ever read the um, that incredible story by the guy that was working for a charity that did some work with Roger Moore and he and he'd met him as a child and he'd got his grandfather to go up to him to ask for his autograph at Nice Airport and then he bumped into yes. him. And he, if you, if you that's, I, I'll reference it now. We'll put a, maybe we'll put a link up now. Yeah. I can't read it all out. It's an amazing story. It is. It's why I know everyone thinks that, that later Bonds were grittier and he was a bit old and at times he might have been less the physical object. But there's something about Roger Moore. If, if he was your if he was your Bond, as Edward rightly points out, 
there was a levity to it. And I just loved how every situation, however serious, could be debunked by a raised eyebrow. It was, it was, you know, you could be on the end of the <laughs> Armageddon and, and he'd do that and you suddenly felt okay. It but was, he is what I mean, he was the man when you he was the man you wanted to grow into when yeah, you were yeah. 10. The voice you, know, you just everyone wanted to be Roger Moore. Well, <laughs> just a quick, quick, quick last Roger Moore anecdote, just before we talk about cars. My wife's uncle was a film and TV director, and he directed a few episodes of The Saint back in the 60s with Roger Moore. <clears throat> and they he was in the Navy, and uh, that generation had this incredible kind of gallows humour, this sort of wartime humour. I remember Uncle John, he was, he was actually dying at uh, UCLH, and um, Roger Moore sent him an email. And they had this sort of, he could see he's cleverly, clearly never sent an email, doesn't do emails. So it actually had his email address on it. And the nurses all thought this was a joke. And it basically said, John, fucking get out of bed, you fuck. Because otherwise, you're not going to make my day, you fucking cunt. Get out of it. <laughs> like that, Roger. And that was their humour, those boys, you know? And Uncle John died, sadly. But I just remember, you know, thinking, you know, they they had a friendship. That bond, whatever it was, even if they'd just done a few saints together, that that generation, they were extraordinary. extraordinary yeah, beautiful. People. Yeah. We can I've, do a I've whole a little, episode on Bond. We should do. <laughs> oh, I've, I've a little off-piste um, car chase, if I could just give you for one minute. And the movie's called Rendezvous. I'm sure everyone knows oh, yeah. it. Oh, if, yes. you don't, if you don't know it, you should. It's an eight-minute film. There's no speaking. It's made in Paris, 5 a.m., 1976, the year of the heat wave. Really a steamingly hot morning in Paris. There's a guy called um, Claude uh, Lelouch, that straps a camera to the front of his own 450 Mercedes 6.9 and drives right the way through Paris, breaking every rule through every red light. Then he puts the soundtrack to his own 275 GTB and right away through Paris, through um, the Art de Triomphe, uh, past the Concorde, through Madeleine, Opera, all the way to Montmartre, all the way up to Sacre Coeur, just to meet a girl. And it's a silent movie apart from a Ferrari 275. Brilliant French car spotting. It's amazing how many Peugeots there were, much yeah. more Peugeots than there were Citroen. And it's a wonderful thing. It was banned for many years, but now you can buy it on DVD and you can find it on YouTube. But if you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend it. It's beautiful. And, and sadly, people try and recreate it, but it needs to be left alone. Yes. It really is yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Alone. I, I did. At I have to admit, I did attempt it once in a gold 6.3 1969 Mercedes, <laughs> and I on my own, and I tried to record it. Remember the flip camera? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which had a little <laughs> USB plug. Yeah. Yes. And that, I've still got the USB. I've still got the little camera. It's in there, but I I can't get any charge into the bloody thing. So. You're right, Chris, it's probably best not to be reenacted, but I did attempt it once on my own. If you get the power into it, we'd like to see the bit where you get carted off to Clinky by the French Rosen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's the red lights, it's the dustbin men, it's the milkman, it's the beautiful women hanging on the corner. The whole thing is gorgeous. The hubcaps spinning down the road and there's cars getting out of your way. It's, it's also, it's the Parisian equivalent of sort of Sunday morning testing for the Tiger Florio, isn't it? The idea that you're you should it shouldn't be happening but we love the fact that it is yeah i don't know about yeah. you guys but there's i've always had this problem with car chases in films because i think they expose me as being too much of a car geek i i i haven't seen a flawless car chase in a film that that hasn't triggered me in some way through accuracy through continuity through the fact that a vehicle shouldn't be driving in that manner. I was watching a film the other day and I stopped it in front of my girlfriend and I said, no, 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 no. That car there couldn't have done that because it has an electronic handbrake and he couldn't have handbrake around that corner. And she's thinking, what on earth are you doing? And for that point on, I'm done because I'm thinking, yeah. no, I, we've, they've taken me to a place of unre mechanical unreality. And, and I think one of the, the, for me, the point, the film that, um, separates those that are merely into the subject and those that are medically under should be under supervision, like, like us, us, probably, 
is Ronin, because Ronin yeah. is rightly considered to be one of the great chase sequences, but it's riddled with continuity errors. It I mean, is. riddled. At one point, an E34 M5 goes off the side of a road, and the wheel that's spinning afterwards is quite clearly a 535i crossbow. It's not yes. a, it's, it's <laughs> I not know, a I that, Yeah. I, and I, and you're, I'm, what, everyone's there going, well, you must be loving this, monkey Harris. It's Ronin, it's bloody car fest. And I'm, I'm there thinking, no, I can't do this. There's too there's many an, errors. There's an, there's an S8 in it, isn't there? Only there a, is, yeah. There's, 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 there's De Niro. They, they converted a car to right to right hand drive, a Peugeot 406, and De Niro sits too high in, yeah. in a fake left hand drive with a fake steering wheel, just doing this to make it look real. But he's sitting too high, and the thing's behaving like it's a 500 horsepower four wheel drive rallycross car, yeah. which it probably was underneath. Because I'm there going, it looks great, but that isn't a 406. That should have, that should have lift off oversteer boss. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, it's so sad. It but is. It was made by time. it was made by John Frankenheimer, who he set the bar very high. Said, "I'm going to make a car chase in this film that will make anybody else think twice about doing another car chase." And it sort of sadly didn't quite hit that barrier. Also, it had a 450 SCL six point. At a 450 SEL 6.9 in it, which was fantastic. Yeah. It had it had a fleet of Citroen XM V6s, which they're some of the coolest cars ever. Yeah. So I loved it, but I, I have this problem with so many car films. I, I, yeah. I really do. And, and actually, but maybe Manish, we should do one. I, I mean, so, but I was I was going to say that you know, in the words of Buzz Lightyear, you are one sad, pathetic little man. <laughs> I've, I've known that I've sort of made a career out of it uh, and, so, so are we all so I, are I would say all. that I would say that but maybe what separates Bond films is that but because of our maybe just as a British citizen because our love for James Bond is so deep yeah we are, I think we afford it a bit more leeway when it absolutely. comes to absolutely like, yeah, totally yeah, it's but just don't scrutinize it the same way and I have to say so one of the great um sort of unheralded brilliant bond chase sequences at the beginning of quantum of solace there's some fantastic yes. driving in that and yeah actually, uh, ben collins he's a mate of mine you know fair play to him there's some amazing work he did in that film um but i think daniel craig's played an amazing modern bond and actually looking at the car chases motorbike chases defenders and things like that they're brilliant they really are yeah. very very good, yeah, good. And, the, and, the, and there was someone in that dbs when it rolled at, at, at millbrook i mean they they had no idea what was going to happen it ended up yeah. being the most rotations ever recorded in a film they just went to the top of millbrook what we call the hill route put an explosive charge under this thing going quite quick and flipped it and it went i think did it go 16 times I, I, a lot. it's written no. down somewhere yeah it's outrageous I mean, that's the thing about bond though even a shit one is better than most other films <laughs> yeah. yeah, we went to. I've got one Bond, uh, well, one Bond driving uh, um, story. We were down at um, at Chobham, which is the it's an old MOD facility down on by the M3 where Autocar used to do most of its photography. And I remember we had a brand new pre production Lamborghini Murcielago, whenever that would have been. That would have been 2001, maybe. Um, it was yellow, and HR owner had put their number plate Yevo on it, Y E V I L, which was often the, mm. the it was owned by mm -hmm. Dominic Lancaster's Nick Lancaster's, it was his plate. Uh, sorry, it was Dominic Lancaster's mother's plate they used to put on the car. That was it. Um, and we we had the car to drive, and it and it snowed, and so we were presented with this lovely you know scene. It was a, a yellow Lamborghini, cut white snow everywhere. Chobham is probably the most dangerous section of asphalt in the UK. It's an old tank testing range. It has a banked circuit that you can go quite fast on around the outside um, with just trees on the outside. No barrier at all. You just go off the tarmac tree. And there's a little thing that runs through the middle of it, a wiggly bit that's up and down, which is just known as the snake to test drivers. Um, and you don't mess around in the snake because if you fall off there, you're in even more trouble. Anyhow, we're there with this Lamborghini and I went and did one lap around the outside and I came back in and went, this is disastrous. If I do anything, it will fall off. At that moment, a bloke arrives, or two blokes arrive, with a truck. And in the back of it, they've got this thing that looks like a, it's a space frame with a quad cam V8 um, uh, Ford engine in it. And it's, they're a bit offish. And he said, we well, said, what are you doing, guys? Well, we're, we're working on the new Bond film. It was going to be the one that had, it was one of the worst Bond films ever made. It was the one where they went, um, the bloke that had diamonds in his cheek, I think, Die it Another died, Day. Die another day. And it had a vanquish in it that was, and its trick was it became invisible. I mean, Vanish. 
remember that Vanquish, Invisible Vanquish, and they had a Jaguar XK that had guns that came out. It was a green XK. Yeah, the green XK. one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've seen that at the Peterson Museum in in LA. That's that's yeah. that was, so yeah. so the, so this this is the this is the buck the the buck for the um, the Jaguar XK, and they and they, the guys say, well, we're going to go out in it now, and I said, around the back there, it's terrible. It's, it's icy and snowy. Don't do it. And they went, mate, wind your neck in. We're bloody Bond stunt drivers. And I was like, mm, they, they probably are. I'll wind my neck in. Anyhow, about 20 minutes later, one lad came back, holding, pretty much holding a steering wheel, saying, yeah, it's in the trees out there. And it was just in, in bits. And it was probably caught a million quid. I mean, the money they spent on these, they didn't give a shit. It was just destroyed. Yeah. And they just took the other one home and went back. Amazing. The, the, they're, the, like, they're, they're, like the, um, they're like the minis in the Italian job. Uh, there have been a few expenses, Mr. Bridger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I, yeah, I've got this thing about bloody car films. I, I, it, it's made me think that one day, and Manish, you might be involved in this, I just want to make a film that has the peerless car chase in it, that, that, cannot, that, that cannot be pulled apart by anyone. Anyone. Yeah. Can we do it? Hmm. We've got to do it. Challenge. Now, I never thought Challenge. I'd say this in public. Mo moving on from Bond car chase sequences to what's your favourite dashboard? <laughs> 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 Edward, look, Edward, love it. I never thought I'd ask you this. What's, what's your favourite dashboard? <laughs> Oh, I did, I did say this to Rohan this morning in the office. I was like, uh, what's your favourite uh, dashboard, Rohan? And uh, he, I'm not sure he would fit in quite here at the geek level because it was <laughs> new Rolls-Royce Phantom. <laughs> <laughs> That's his answer to everything. It, it, it pretty much. Well, it, sometimes it's Cullen and done. Phantom, Cullen you know, done. dawn if the weather's nice. Um, so I... I, I I love the machined finish on the period Bentleys and then the like the modern Bentley Continental or the more modern Bentley Continental T. Um, and then I think that also goes with the Spiker. They, that was an amazing dash. These Ooh. are not cars I really want to own, but I just, mm. I love the dashboards on them. So I think- You like, you like a bit of aluminium plate. I did, does. yes. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. Sp Spiker from a in sort of design point of view, I thought they did a brilliant job. But there's there's two cars and they're quite similar, but I think- BMW Z8, yeah. but it has to have red leather. I think that for me is as simple yeah. and as pretty as a modern dashboard Mustache, gets. Yeah. And then there's a period car, which is a 250 GT short wheelbase competition special, which is chassis number 1739 <laughs> GT, designed by Bertoni. Go and Google it, look at the gear knob. Um, but look at the dashboard is beautiful in that car. So there, wow. there's my geek level of love of the dashboards. No Clifford, come on. Right, I'm, I'm come on. Time limit on this. I was so tempted to go German 90s because, of course, that's really where it all lies, whether it be Mercedes or BMW. The, the, the truth is there. And it's probably the truth in the S-Class in the mid-90s. But I, I, I took a diversion because I took a diversion because I knew everyone else would go German 90s. So I'm going late 80s Bentley, the Turbo R, mm. the Allen Clark era, oh. the early models, so the very thin steering wheel before they messed up the steering wheel as they went into sort of Conti R and Conti T. The beautiful, actually, I would go with wood as opposed to turned in aluminium because I don't think there were many turned aluminium in the saloon. And I, I, I recently bought a saloon for 12 grand. And the dash is bloody fantastic. The all the dials, slightly different colours of illumination, being British. Um, <laughs> the best air conditioning unit you have ever designed in your life. The twin um, horizontal dials that you just flip from red to blue. The, the way they roll, the dial oh, roll. that's beautiful, and it works actually. And the the horn button where you can choose between city and country so you've got two horns <laughs> and then in the in the fuel gauge you have a lovely little secret button that you press and it tells you your oil level so that one single dial does two jobs by just a single press of a button i don't think even though design perspective it is 90s germany i think it's all about the late 80s bentley 
Turbo R. The one thing about the Bentley interior that reminds me what does make a great interior is I just there's something about getting the rake of the center console as it flares out. That's oh, beautiful. Yeah. And the, I think the Porsche 928 always did that really well. It just it felt quite intimate the way it comes out towards you. You want to feel like this, there's this sort of mass. If it's too upright and it's away from you, it doesn't feel intimate. You don't no, feel like you feel you're like you're getting car. in an aircraft. You are do yeah. feel like getting in an aircraft. Yeah. And the heated seats, you know, are probably causing a hole in the ozone layer. Yeah. I mean, they're so powerful. Volcanic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Chris Cooper, so, what would you, what, what, what dashboard are you going for? Um, I mean, it's got to be late 80s BMW E28, E30. It's mm. just, it's, I remember I used to massively into offshore yacht racing uh, when I was still at university. And the guy who owned the boat I used to race on, he had big corporate life. He had a BMW 520, E28. 520 and he once let me borrow it to go to a party in london we've been sending on the phone somewhere and i asked okay right this is really grown up i just loved the that just the whole feeling of that dashboard and that cowl that, that sort of like the flat bit and then and the e30 it's like oh, just e30 um what, what what year did the little onboard computer come in in a bmw where it had different different models had different little buttons been, well you had two didn't you because in in the yeah. e28 um, you had the one up in the top there, which was the, check, the red yeah, lights and everything that was up there. And then they had that in the E30 as well. Yeah. And then you had the yeah. onboard computer, which in, honestly, the one in my E28 M5, how old is that? That's 86, that car. Yeah. If, if you leave it alone for a year, fill it up with fuel, the range monitor on that computer is bang on even now. It's, That's a, it's, it's beautiful. That. And the temperature always worked. Yep. Yeah. The temperature. Yeah. It always yeah. work and also BMW the, gave you the temperature gauge for free whereas Mercedes if you look on your spec sheet from an 80 Mercedes they'll be they'll charge 110 pounds for OTG outside temperature OTG. gauge <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yeah. how do we function <laughs> without a torch in the glove box anymore in a modern uh, uh, Manish, uh, what, what dashboard are you, you're, you're going to go for you're going to go for a bit serene or something aren't you no 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 no. I, I talked about this car and actually Neil picked up on it and I would be a bit boring but I've I drove it this is the car I drove to Las Vegas the 560 SEC, yeah. it's just, yeah, just there is that's the I mean, you know, you, you just th there it is, you know, not to 160 miles an hour and a big dial right in front of your nose. And then I remember the um, you know, the revs are just there and um, had all the little gauges just in one other dial here, and then you know, the electric buttons. And then, does every anyone remember it was like a it was like a pre-LED panel that was underneath and just you know the oil light was there and and it was just it's it's perfect man just just exactly I, I'm, I'm on dashboards I'm sort of surprised I'm surprised we haven't picked up so far I'm surprised you're looking like General Medrano from Quantum of Solace you actually know what the dashboard of a car looks like oh well look I'm I'm I can really bore you to you know what my favorite switch is so we could go deeper the <laughs> the, the E30 window switch you like those, do you? You cannot beat that as an electric window one. switch. Yeah. That is okay. the most beautiful switch ever invented. On the right on, Chris. Okay, so I tried to be, I tried to resist the urge to go 80s, 90s Germany, but I, I have got some hang-ups in this area, and I think it just refers back to being a young kid and going to car showrooms when I was so young. My father always used to have very basic spec BMWs. And I became obsessed with graduating to having less blanks on the dashboard. Ooh, For me, blanks. I just was obsessed with not having blanks. And actually, BMW, when it was at its genius best in the 80s and 90s, really only made one dashboard. It just adapted it for different cars. And I, I love that driver-centric um, dashboard. They were the only ones that had the bollocks to say, the driver matters here. Passenger... You should just be lucky. You're along for the ride. The driver is going to have the dials facing them, the radio facing yep. them. It's all about you as the driver. And, and then the, the, what would happen is they would, they would add opulence and buttons yes. as required. So for me, it has to be that 80s, 90s design language with the most buttons. I think one of the great shames of modern car interiors is I like simplicity, but I'd love a button. And I just think yep. when done correctly, there's a glamour. To the, to the button. So it has to be an E34 Alpina B10 by turn oh. with all with all the buttons on it. I mean, so many buttons. I think there must be over a hundred buttons on display in the car. 
Yeah. Uh, and with a with a with a cloth seat as well with the Alpina stripes, just to just to bring that out. I I just I don't know about you. If I buy an older German car, I just sit and play with the buttons before I go. Oh, it's lovely. Just that, the, the, the little stuff. computer in the E30 um, is a wonderful little thing, even though you didn't know what half of it did. Yeah, yeah. that was, was the point. Really I can't really even computer. remember what the buttons did. Yeah. yeah. And and then when then they moved to, when they went three one AIS, which was sort of you know a, 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 I suppose a poor person's M three. They they you couldn't get that computer. You had a, a lovely little clock. Yes, they, and that clock. clock. Yeah. So that clock is a, a very handsome little clock. And my, my, I didn't have a three one I S because I wasn't at the same pay grade as my mate. But when he got, we were slightly disappointed in the beginning. It didn't have that computer. But actually, you more you got to know about that clock that only came really in the three one eight I S. It was a uh, special E30, little part of the dashboard. Hmm? E30, 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 E30 318 yeah. IS, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll add one car that, that uh, because I have to come across as a totally privileged bastard sometimes. Um, I do love 50s and 60s car interiors. I mean, there's an argument for saying the greatest car interiors were 1950s Ameri Americana. Yeah. It, it was just theatre. They just, they did, there was no concession to ergonomics. It was just how great can you make this? And also they had acres to play with because the things were land yachts. But actually, it, it's impossible not to acknowledge some of the Beaglia clocks from Ferraris of the 50s and 60s. Yeah, and absolutely. If you've ever sat in a real 250 yeah. LM, which is basically just bare flock, two of the most beautiful clocks you've ever seen, and these three little dials down by your right thigh, uh, that is that yeah. might be the best for me. If, if I was being, if I was trying to resist my 80s, 90s German addiction, I'd go there. Can uh, I just say, <laughs> the worst, worst, worst dashboard in the history of humanity for me is the second series Lagonda. Literally, it's just a Sinclair ZX80, not even an 81, stuck behind this bizarre... Do you remember the steering wheel had that funny yeah. L shape? Yeah. It was yeah. just... I, I, I hate to say it. I, oh, come on, I, I think it's quite cool, but I'm going to get shot <laughs> I mean, next like next week, we're system. on to gear knobs. What about an original <laughs> Citroen GS? What about Oh, I can talk oh. for ages about knobs. Citroen, <laughs> Citroen, Citroen GS, Citroen GS. I mean, some of them were just... I mean, the Citroen CX, I remember first going one of those, and it had that sort of weird rotating speedometer yeah. that yes. flowed in the yeah. dark. Yeah. I don't think there's ever been a good Vauxhall dashboard. I can't uh, think of how about you, you've got a deep hate for Vauxhall. That that's that's another episode of it. I've got I reckon, a deep I'm looking at Carlton GSI 24 valve. That wasn't a bad dash. Yeah. There's no first, symmetry. They've des they've designed it with with I don't know with a blindfold on. First Vauxhall Have a look. Astra, terrible to death. That wasn't bad. Can, so comments comments section. That's a very controversial comment from Neil Clifford there. Has there ever been a good <laughs> Voxel. <laughs> How do we say this shit with a straight? This is important work. Right. Okay. But uh, okay. I now need before we get into F one. Um, uh, I need to make a public service announcement on behalf of collecting addicts. Last week we were discussing police cars. I, I'm now reverting to my solemn voice. We did not mention the Volvo T5, which is arguably the most famous police car of them all. We'd like to apologise on behalf of all T5 we owners, the T5 community, yeah. and T5s themselves for not actually mentioning the T5. Yeah. All of us have been stopped by a T5. All of us respect the T5 for what it stands for. Neil Clifford even owned a T5 estate for which he probably paid too much money. Um, yep. I will say now that it is one of the great police cars. If you want to comment, please do. Moving on, Spanish F1. Tell us what your thoughts are when you get third place. You get third place taken away, you're given fourth place, and then you're given third place back. Fernando Alonso. Um, the FIA yesterday, I saw it in a little tweet, um, said... Listen, we are uh, learning and evolving all the time. <laughs> I kid you not. There is an actual <laughs> press release that says that. We are, we are being responsive. I mean, I, the only thing I've got to say, again, is talk about getting it wrong. Fernando Alonso, just the happy man yeah. of all of Formula. I mean, you know, well, you know, they take away my third place to make it number four is three points. It's not a big deal. It's no problem. You know, I got to enjoy the podium and I get another one next. I mean, can anything go wrong for this guy? What and have they done with the real Fernando? Where's he gone? 
you think he's taking HRT pills? Like he's on the perimenopause <laughs> pill. He's just, he, he was in the pen. He was in the interview pen. George Russell's gone up to him and gone, sorry, pal, I just need your third place. He was like, yeah, no problems, buddy. Yeah. I mean, if it had been did. last year, he'd have stabbed him. Yeah. Yeah, the other day, when he got the penalty, uh, he, he just said, you've got a penalty, Fernando. Copy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, fuck your mother, i got to kill you, you fucking fuck, like that. <laughs> In he comes, you know, so, so, someone, someone breathes on his, you know, literally the jack man. He must have, what is that, 1.1 10 billionth of a kilonewton touch, and that's it, they give him the penalty. I mean, ah. Uh, and then, and then they reversed the. I mean, he was supposed to get the penalty within twenty minutes. Is that right? Twenty yeah. minutes or twenty-five minutes? And they give him the penalty at thirty-eight. And even Fernando, he's sitting down, going, "Well, I kind of wish they told me at the time. You know, I'd have sped up a little bit. I'd have been eleven seconds ahead yeah. of the second place guy. You know, it was so calm. But you're absolutely right. I think the uh, the FIA probably do need to have a quick look I've, at the. I've got, I've got a conspiracy theory here. I think Neil Clifford's got a line into the FIA because. <laughs> the main beneficiary of the outcome of, of Fernando getting his third place back was Lewis Hamilton. Yes. Because that because George benefited from the time penalty, but Lewis didn't. And it meant that actually, provisionally, George overtook him in the World Championship standings, but now he isn't. So, Neil, explain yourself. <laughs> well, I think if you carry around a British passport, you should be supporting Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to George, as opposed to George. Yeah, well, we, when Lewis gets his eight, we then yeah. support George, won't we? I mean, it might be a while. It's pretty, okay. it's... Can I ask, can I ask, I want to ask, Ed would love it. I don't know if you watched the race or not, Edward, but there was a scene at the end that was pretty cringeworthy for all of us. It was Sergio <laughs> Perez celebrating what was his finest win, and he walks past Jos Verstappen, who does the best ever thousand yards of stairs straight past him and just stiffs him. He's a miserable bastard. Is that a good look? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it was, wasn't it? It was extraordinary. It was, utterly, it was utterly charm. It was uh, unbelievably charmless and unnecessary, and just reinforced all of our stereotypes. I mean, the, At least we're trying to find some things to talk about with the Formula yeah. One because the actual well, race, the actual race, was boring. It, it was a bit. It was a bit tedious. The third place thing and the FIA is interesting, and some of you know I've. I've got a bit of an interest in, in, in involved in this. And the problem is they don't see everything. There was a race, a couple of one of the Mexico Grand Prix a couple of years ago. It was the one where Ricardo and Bottas are coming together when Bottas, it must have been the last year Bottas was at Mercedes. And that sort of turn one, two complex, you know, that long, 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 long drag. And it looked like Ricardo had just tipped inside Bottas. And it didn't get spotted at the time, didn't get penaltyed. Other people in that complex got penalties. And I, because I know some of the stewards, and I asked one of them afterwards, I said, why didn't you give a penalty for that? And he sort of looked around a bit and he said, can I tell you a secret? We didn't see it. We didn't spot it. I said, well, why didn't you spot it? I said, well, because there's only, you know, there's only four, you know, there's four stewards and there's the race director and so forth. There's just too much going on. And I think therein lies the conundrum. It's a bit like the whole VAR thing in football, because as you know, F1 now has this VAR room in Geneva. And there's only so much they can see. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a different debate, a wider debate for the FIA about how it moves from being what it was as a sport to a modern professional sport. Most of the stewards, I think, I think I'm sad to be corrected, but I think most of the stewards are still volunteers. They get their travel costs paid. They get a sort of per diem, which is kind of covers a drink and a bit of lunch and so forth. But so that means most of the people involved are either they're there anyway, or they're older people who can afford to indulge the sport. But if you said from a clean sheet of paper, how do we do this? You'd say, I want a younger, broader, professionally trained, recruited, managed group of people who can do this. That's not the model of how it works. And I think that is where, and I hope after, as I said, we're still learning. I, I do think they know this and I do think it will get better. But yeah, at least, as you say, it provided a bit of entertainment in a race that otherwise was a bit short of it. I mean, can I just say that seeing a car being overtaken on a straight is not an overtaking manoeuvre. No. It is a passing manoeuvre. That's very different. Overtaking for me was something someone did under braking or did because they slung shot out of a corner just so much better than the nerf in front of them who missed a gear or something. Yeah. I find it, you know, it's really, really... Watching Max, there's got to be a price that you pay 
for having a mechanical failure in qualifying. And that price has got to be, you've got to overtake your way back to the front. And yeah. what it was like watching, I mean, it really was like watching fish being shot in a barrel. You can't just keep having this button that you press. And I know that the Red Bull is it, sort it, of exceptional. He overtook a couple in, in some fairly extraordinary places. But, but I agree, you know, D DRS is necessary to, to have overtakes, but it, it's... It's, it has devalued the overtake in some well, respects. We, yes. I, I think we have an aero formula, and people are going, "Ooh, Red Bull!" You know this 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 amazing team with its seventeen mile an hour differential. It's an aero formula, and there's mm. a there's a wizard at this aero stuff, mm. and that's Newey. Yeah. And this is just this is an aero formula, and he's got it so right. People are talking about are they doing something very clever? Not just stalling the rear wing, but has he found another way of stalling the car? Maybe stalling the underside of the car. On oh, a undoubtedly, it's under the car, you know? and that's yeah. what, that's what makes it so difficult in a, in a ground effect era. No one can see where it is. In the old days, you could see when Ferrari turned up with the three extra flicks and were managing air over the car. I mean, what would they? What would people pay for a photograph of the underside of that car? Well, someone's got to flip it over, haven't they? I mean, that's what they've got to do. You know, coming out of slow speed corner, just literally get in front of it. He flips over, everyone gets yeah, their Michael out. But yeah. They've got to restrict the number of... I think that the only way to do it, if you want to... Wouldn't it have been great if we had a rule that said you can use DRS exactly three times in a Grand Prix? So he wouldn't have wasted his DRS on all the ones at the back. And maybe he would have ended up eighth, but we'd have had a bloody yeah. exciting Grand Prix. Yeah. Yeah. Three DRS, three times a lap. Come on. Yeah. The car is so fast that he was going to get... Yeah, the back of his teammate anyway. Yeah. McLaren should be able to have their we... DRS open the whole time. Obviously, yeah. that might would, would have that changed their position. Probably not. <laughs> Can I ask one Very question dramatic. about Max? Can I ask a question about Max to people? I thought, in some respects, I was really impressed with Max. He just knuckled down and got the job done. You know, he, he was clearly unhappy about the fact that he um, he'd had a drive shaft problem, and it, and there's no doubt when he's on it, him him in combination with that vehicle is 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 a force to be reckoned with. But there was something about there's something I find as, as, a, as someone who's raced at a very low level, very poorly. Second place is a, is a great thing, and to see a bloke come second after such a you know a gritty drive and then just be totally flat faced and go, "Well, I'm not here to come second." It's, I just don't. I think it's a really bad look for the sport. I yeah. Just don't, I, don't, oh, I, think I don't know. I, I quite admire that. You, do you? What did Jackie Stewart say? I can only remember the races I came first in. First I don't and, yeah. know how many times I came second. That's I'm, I'm asking the question. For me, maybe it's I, thought, just, I can't aspire to such excellence. But I also I think it's it, it was something quite deep rooted. He was he was having a pop at the team. He was saying I shouldn't be in this position. Well, that's just, yeah. That's, 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 the, that's, that, that's, fair, that's fair enough. But I, I I agree with Neil. I respect that. I, I saw an interview with uh, Rory McIlroy, and he he had gone over to Tiger Woods's house and in Tiger Woods's office and his home. He's only got his um, championship trophies. Sorry, I've, I've lost my golf vocabulary. What the? Uh, what are the? Um, majors. The majors. majors. Sorry, majors. He, he's got his ma majors up there, and he said, where, "Where are the rest of your trophies?" It was like, don't know. Don't yeah, care. I, I think there is something about. I mean, Matt, I, I thought I thought it as well in the in the press pool press conference later that evening. He was clearly moaning and whinging a bit about, well, of course, you know, I'm not here to finish second, and I feel let down and so forth. I think there's, it's a bit charmless. And it's a bit, if it you're, is a bit charmless. You can you can argue that you, the way that champions championships are created are they're defined by ha how good a result you drank from your bad weekends, yeah. aren't they? And he um, tried a really really good result from his weekend. And the analogy with golf for me doesn't quite work because when Tiger was beating everyone, he had, he wasn't using a different driver. No, no, that's Tiger. a fair point. Yeah, you know, yeah, Max, bad, Max is not he? acknowledging the fact the reason why he has this expectation of winning every race is because Adrian knew he's got an extraordinary car. Yeah, 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 no, that's fair point. Yeah, do you um, think there was a tiny tiny element though of? team orders for those last few laps because if i had yeah. to bet money 25 laps to go sergio perez is five seconds ahead of mm -hmm. max verstappen mm -hmm. with 25 laps to go i would have put my mortgage yeah. on yeah. max winning if he can't chase down perez and i keep hearing all this street expert street expert he's won five grand prix four on streets so that's not really a street circuit in my book so um oh, I, just, I just don't yeah. i just i just don't i mean i think basically I just think he basically, you know, 
was told not to win. <laughs> you know, yeah, do you yeah. think they have the power in that team to tell him not to win? I think that's what they were trying to do. And I think he was pissed off. And I think he realised with five laps to go or 10 laps to go, four tenths a lap, even he couldn't pull that out. Interesting. Okay. I, I, mean, I was impressed with Stroll, that that overtake on the, on the front. Right. Yeah. I have to say, I'm probably wrong about Stroll. I thought whether, you know, I don't know what the score is on Ferrari and the Aston's better, but that was a pretty ballsy overtake. Yeah, I thought yeah. that was cool, actually. What, about, what about towards? What about in the closing phases? Last F1 question to you guys. Lando's having a bit of a shocker. I'm a Bristol boy. Lando's from this part of the world. I am Team Lando. Piastri, either either Lando had a damaged car, but at the end, when Piastri managed to get a Williams between him and not with and Lando, didn't expect that at all. No, Piastri is the first driver that's going to give Lando trouble. Yeah, he yeah. looks like so far one and a half races he's had, wherever it is. Um, and and I what think, does that say about Ricciardo? Well, oh. nothing we didn't already know. Says he's got eighteen million dollars in the bank and he's living. Yeah, apart life. from that, yeah, is he happy? Yeah. Um, right. Um, the two-car garage conundrum. I've got to read this <laughs> off my telephone now. Sorry if there's some noise outside. The local primary school is going off on their walk to the zoo or something, and they're frightfully noisy. Um, I need a photograph. This is suggested this week by Chris Cooper. I apologise, he doesn't understand the word brevity. You and your partner have just resigned from corporate life in the UK. I know how that feels. Now that children have left home and you've moved to the French Alps just outside Chamonix, about an hour from Geneva. It's, it's pronounced Chamonix, but not Chamonix. You've set up a small travel business, organising hiking trips in the summer and managing a few ski chalets in the Jev in winter. <coughs> Swapping keys. You've set aside €50,000 for two cars. One must be capable in winter with enough space to do airport runs to Geneva, but it must still be a fun daily driver as well. The other will hibernate in the winter, only needs two seats and be a great driver's car on the quieter roads of late spring and early autumn. Possibly a track day, occasionally at Dijon or Clermont-Ferrand. Glorious track. Right. Um, I reckon it's your conundrum, Mr. Cooper. You need to set the pace. Yeah. So I showed this to you last week. I saw... Uh, I, I exchanged emails with them this morning, and unfortunately it's sold. There was a glorious 2002 E46 BMW 330iX when the iX really meant something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like a mid-green metallic, tan inside, no M Sport stuff, sensible alloys, non-chavy spec, beautiful thing, 100,000 kilometres. And he just nice. sold it for, I think it went for 10,000 euros. Okay. And he said he bought it from a guy who had a, a BMW dealer in Vienna who had 100 cars. And so I'm going to go and try and go and see what he's got next. So that's what you'd have. That would be fun a whole year round. Yeah. Do airport runs, do the whole thing. Um, you know, about 35,000 euros left. Um, you've left the UK, corporate life. You've never had a chance to do before. It can only be a TVR Griffith. Uh, that's what I have. Uh, you are so proud of these choices. One of them's broken down. That's not going to start at the new. <laughs> thing, is right. it? What, what <laughs> card do you have for when the TVR doesn't work? This is not a free. It will work. It's a, it's a toy car. We had. I'll a, come and start. I'll come and start it for you. Like, <laughs> no, I'm really in trouble. Also, really have you trouble. seen? Have you seen when you turn up at Geneva Airport with with the packed with your bags and a massive coat on for the weekend. Get cramming yourself in the back behind you. Well, that's what the other one's for. That's IX. the other car. Listen to any of this, Edward. No, I did. No, I, you you said the other one's doing the airport runs. It's terrible choices. <laughs> it's controversial. This is controversial. By the way, I've just I've just run over my toe with my office chair and I'm in fucking agony. <laughs> we, had a, we had a Chimera 20, 30 years ago. We had a Chimera that never ever broke down or stopped on this and this is the and this is, i agree with you uh, tbrs have to be split between ajps and rovers rovers work Brilliant. AJPs don't exactly right. end of Quite simple fair enough okay edward given that you've been so critical of what i think were some very very canny choices by mr cooper who'll be paying for my lunch on friday yeah. i think you should counter now <laughs> oh well, I was trying to be, I was trying to go and read the, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've I've been on to mobila.de because I thought it's more important. I had to go shopping in Europe, not in, on auto trade or, or on collecting cars. So um a BMW 550 
X drive. That's what I've gone well, for because you need a no. bit more space. You know, if you're doing airport runs, you know, you want, yeah. you want a fruity engine. Um, and then for my weekend car, which I'm sure will start, is a Lotus Exige V6 Club Sport with the roof that comes off. Okay. I'll, I'll um, no, I think we can endorse that. The 550. Uh uh, is a really is a fantastic car actually. The, the the M the diesel one they did was an absolute yeah. monster as well. Yeah. That was a good car and the Exige, that era of Exige, I don't understand. For me, an Exige didn't have a roof that came off it. When Lotus did that two or three years of a yeah. roofless Exige, we we're all going, well, that's an Elise, isn't it? Isn't yeah. that, is that not? It's a bit like saying I've made a box de coupe. Well, that's a Cayman, isn't it? It's, it <laughs> they they totally confused their nomenclature. Someone put LSD in the water in Norfolk. Neil Clifford, carry on, please. Get me I've, away from broke my, I've broken my first rule of life. I've gone Japanese. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to find the cheapest bloody family thing so I could spend some money elsewhere. So I've gone Subaru Forester. Oh, yes, good call. Cool. Cool. Hopefully a Litchfield edition. It's about 15 grand. Never owned one, actually, but I've always wanted one. I've always had a niche for that. I think it's a cool little four-by-four thing. Debadged, those lovely wheels. I then buy the best, so 20 grand, maybe 25 grand, Lotus Elise Mark I. Oh. Mm. Yeah, I just buy a Minter. And actually, I owned one a couple of years ago. Fantastic little car. It's like a Mini F40, this thing. The dash, one of the best dashes, mm, fantastic little car. I've got yeah. ten grand left actually, so I'm going to buy a 205 GTI 1.9 as well, so I can <laughs> fuck, up, fuck about in that, Not or even one, but yeah. to, to cheer Chris up because if you're living in bloody France, you need a French car, or even yeah. a little two CV, you know, the little three, the three yeah. seven five. Um, I think rip, you're ripple right. bonnet. That, Neil, that's a, that's so funny because I go, I was googling last night legacies and foresters so and also typed into the collecting cars sold section two hundred five GTIs because I yeah I remember one year I was driving I th I was in an Audi R eight uh, V ten manual and I was doing some recce work for a road tour that I was planning. And I couldn't shake off this guy in a 205 GTI coming down the other side of a mountain pass in France. It was just, I thought, he's having so more fun than me, for sure. I mean, if you're moving to France and you don't want to be gobbed on, you need a French car. <laughs> yeah. You do. Yeah, that part of France isn't really France. I mean, I've said lots of French people like, sort of, it's, is it Italian? Is it Swiss? Bit of everybody's manish your everybody. friends joined you your yeah, snow uh, dog uh, manish manish what's your two car garage come on um, so tuco you can choose as well well okay this is probably gonna be a bit boring but i quite like the idea of a jeep renegade for, for two liters i thought you know a little yeah, Stellantis nice. stuff going on there a little bit italian four four wheel drive you can definitely get some luggage into that found a very nice one for 15,000 euros as well. It was pretty damn good. Quite a lot of mileage. Did little fleet news type data, 550, 550 kilograms worth of worth of load on that car. That's four yeah, fat four runs. and their luggage, yeah, isn't it? I mean, you're, <laughs> you're laughing, okay? No, so crazy. Crazy. The idea of you, the idea of you with, the, with the beautiful Japanese center poster behind going on to fleet news i just yeah. i am so addicted to it's, brilliant, that, isn't it? to it's just unput downable I'll have to do it last thing in the evening because the otherwise no yeah. other work yeah and then I, you know i just i quite I, I drove one of these a while ago and i must admit i to think they're beautiful just i just get a nice 3.4 porsche boxster yeah, flip yeah. the lid down on that. Drive around in Chamonix and Geneva and by the lakes mm. and things. I'd I'd love one of those. That would be my two car garage. Thirty five thousand euros, no problem. Well, there you got fifteen to spend on um, three fantastic holidays that year. You see, man, you thought about it. Yeah, in my in my new business. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. You can go to the wife swapping chalet with the yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> keys in the sauna, darling. <laughs> uh, I, I think um, I, I've, I've vacillated usually here. I very confidently told Manish on the phone yesterday what my choices were going to be, and I've changed them three times since then. <laughs> um, so I'm going to end up with this. I'm going to go, one of these is a bit of a repeat, but there's a nuance to it. The, the four-wheel drive, the best 
four wheel drive estate car I've ever owned wasn't one of the super duper MRSs. It was an Audi B8 S4 that mm. I that I, I had a couple of these, and they're a bit of a they're a bit of a lurking gem that no one knows about because it's a it's a it's a softer riding car than an RS4. It has a narrower body. No one spots them. Take the badges off. It's got four exhaust pipes. It's a bit annoying because that gives the game away. But I'd almost like to change the exhaust. But for about 10, 12 grand. That Good thing, car. you get an MTM chip on it, or whatever, or whatever the people I had then, at 400 horsepower, keep up with an RS4 in a straight line, innocuous, four-wheel drive, some winter tyres, I'm covered off there. Also, my late dog, my Weimaraner, was the only estate car he liked, and uh, any any car that gets an endorsement by your woofer has to be acknowledged, I think, because he, yeah. he, he had a Golf R, and I sold it after a week, because he thought it was shit. <laughs> um, so, my sports car, I think I totally agree with this Hethel fixation. I think when the way that Chris described what you want to do, all of us imagined ourselves wanting some Lotus. You want the steering, you want the lightness, you want the agility. And in my testing years, there was a standout Elise, and they should be worth a bit more necessarily than they are. They did a thing called the Sport 135. Yeah, K-Series right? engine. And yeah. it was it was the K-Series yeah. with a, just a, a bit a slightly yeah, the, different, I think, the um, super exhaust. Sport, and, and it, yeah. was, it was not much v more. The VVC much, bit. bit. No, VVC. no, it wasn't VVC. No, the VVC had more power, too complicated. and that engine used to shit itself. Whereas, but the Sport One Three Five had a bit of chassis work, and it was a real sweet spot. So, I think for me, B Eight S Four and nice. at least. But I have to say, I, I had to overcome the urge to buy a Panda Four by Four and just deal with the yeah, audience. just two grand. Yeah, I, just I think you're all. I think you're all wrong because on those mountain valley sides, you want a V Eight echoing off. It's well, you're just going to be there by the side of the road. You're going to hear your starter motor. Yeah, you won't. Hear, isn't it? You won't. You, you don't space. want to be broken down with no service halfway up a bloody mountain. I'm going to bloody get one and show you. But everyone would say, have you met the weird English man that sits in the lay-by all day telling us about Peter Wheeler's dog biting up front of the body work? <laughs> you can all fuck off. <laughs> now, um, uh, let's, we're going to move on to a bit of music. We've, we've gone on a bit too long here, but so I do apologise. Um, so I would say, Edward Lovett, give us a tune for the week. OK, so I'm not going to give you one of my tunes. I, so I had someone contact me on Instagram named uh, an artist called uh, Dickie Gamble, and he, he wrote uh, three different tunes to us. But for each one, he wrote the journey he'd be doing and the car he'd be in. So I'm going to pick one of them. The, it's called Ride, Leave Them All Behind. The journey, rolling off the ferry ramp at first light with a cross-continent blast ahead of you, morning mist sitting at eye level with the flickering of beautiful sunny day straining onto itself or to show itself. The car, 612, manual in dark green with tobacco leather interior <laughs> with a tub of Haribo on the passenger seat. <laughs> so yeah, that's a good he choice, Dickie. He knows us. He does, yeah. yeah. And, um, I, and also, I'm, I'm a Manuel 612 was a thing of joy. I yeah. drove those once. Bloody good car. Right. Um, Manish, dazzle us with some Brahms or Beethoven. Slightly, slightly off piece again. Today would have been Senna's 63rd birthday. Oh, oh why do you oh. do this to us? <laughs> Shit. So, um, no, no, and I always find this sort of time of year just, you know, it just, it does make me feel sort of very wistful. And on March the 19th, 1999, at the Royal Festival Hall, um, a composer called um, Priesner, um, he, he had the world premiere of um, something called Requiem for My Friend. He was the composer who did all the music for um, a director called Kistrov Kislowski. And his most famous films were the three colored films, three colors red, three colors white, three colors blue. This is 25 years ago. Anyway, the Point is, Paul Kislowski died in 1998. He was only 55. And so his mate Prisoner created a requiem for him. And there is the Lacrimosa in it, which is the last piece on, on, on the album. The words are literally Lacrimosa, 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 tears, 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 tears. And I always think of this piece of music because I heard it on March 19th 1999 and two days later it was Senna's birthday and he would have been 39 so that is the piece of music for the week and it breaks your heart and the woman who sang it she's a soprano called Elisabetha Tawanica 
And she has a seven octave voice, which is what you need to sing this. And it just, I listened to it yesterday just to make sure I would want to hear this in a car and you would want to hear this on a car. It's a beautiful oh, yeah. piece of Brilliant. I always, I always feel I need to phone my therapist after these. I just, yeah. Just... Well, I don't know whether anyone can tell. I'm sure you can't. But Manish went to Cambridge and I got 1-0 level in arts. Sh shall I do my <laughs> music choice? Yeah, you go next. Um, it's the first car I ever bought, Ford Escort Mark I, with those beautiful... The stereo was worth more than the car, that very early Sony XR70, I think it was called, that had a Dolby button but also a metal button. A Ooh. Metal button. Ooh. So you'd go down to the first, Vir first Virgin record store, it was actually in Portsmouth, and you could buy a TDKM. Do you remember the metal? Yeah. Tape? The metal frame TDK tape. Metal. The, the yeah. metal frame tape. It was about yeah. four quid then. It's probably about I'd, 50 I'd quid now. And you'd, you'd, you'd knit it round to your mate's house, and he's got a Marantz double tape recorder. Oh, so you could, tape. you could nick all his music, and it was the lexicon of love. Oh, right. ABC. A lexicon of Love, ABC. And I suppose the best track, they're all brilliant. The Look of Love, part one. Yeah. And you stick that little tape into the thing and off you go in your Mark One Escort. And, and it was two paradise. Yeah. Yeah. Trevor Horn, right? Trevor Horn produced that. Yeah, it's a beautiful... Oh, God, it's an album. Yeah, he's a beautiful man. I've got a good friend called William Hunt that made the gold suit. You remember the gold yeah, suit yeah. on top of the box? Yes. Yeah, he, he, and he still makes them for him because he, uh, they, they still play, ABC still play, and they still wear that gold suit. And that man has an amazing voice, doesn't he? For amazing a, voice. Beautiful yeah. voice. Still does. So, um, Manish, you're going to really appreciate my choices. Uh, I was torn between um, Justin Timberlake, Can't Stop the Feeling, and Dua Lipa in physical. But in the end, <laughs> in the end, I went for... John Miles, music was my first love. That is wow. the soaring, soaring sonic cathedral of an Great anime. Song. Just That's a cute he song. was uh, sort of borderline prog rock, Alan Parsons project. But that film, that when that builds and builds, that is a song to drive to. John Miles, music was my first love. Hmm. Chris, finish us off. Bloody hell, but that's a bit strong. Um, <laughs> I would. Um, I. Yeah, I, I wanted to go for one of these tracks that I used to listen to super late at night when I was when I was in my day job, hacking across continents because they were quite romantic times actually. And I remember doing a, a story with Steve Sutcliffe um, where we had a Focus RS and a Lamborghini Murcielago. Yeah, we went on Spain. this massive drive around Europe, and I can never tell you the real story, but we were both quite sort of hormonal characters, and we probably fell out about six times in a week. And in, I remember one time when. I think my passport got lobbed out of a window or something, and then Steve fucked off to Liège at speed in a Lamborghini, and I gave chase from Paris in a Focus, couldn't keep up with him. And I, there was one tune that I had on on the CD player in the Focus RS, which was a random tune. Look it up; it's a, it's a great tune. You'd have heard it, but you wouldn't know the same. It's called "Touch Me" by Rui de Silva. Um, Google it afterwards. It's just a it's a cheesy dance track from 2002. But uh, I'll tell you what, if you're doing 143 miles an hour, which is what a Focus RS will do in normal air, and you're just flat and you've been pinned for about an hour in the thing, and that is absolutely cranked up with you, you'll always remember the song because you remember the moment. Uh, so I, I plead you to not think that I'm an intellectual mouse compared to manage, well, I am. Um, and I, I can't describe things the way he can, but it's a, it's a cheesy dance track, and we all, we need these in our lives. It can't yes, we do. Yes. Soaring yes. musical uh, theatre and cathedrals. It can't all be like that. Um, and I think that's now the time to conclude what's been another fantastically enjoyable episode for us. You will have to endure it, the 10th of these sittings. Uh, we'll see you next time on the Collecting Addicts podcast. <laughs>